Hello friends, here are eight fascinating lessons and parallels between pro-slavery Christians and Christians today who support abortion. In the earlier days of the United States of America, when slavery was legal, it is a sad, unfortunate fact that many Christians and churches did support and defend and practice slavery. Not all of them, of course, but many did. This man here is James Burney, who is well known as a staunch abolitionist and who represented the anti-slavery Liberty Party. In 1840, he published this book here titled The American Churches, The Bulwarks or Defenses of American Slavery, where he compiled many examples from various churches and church leaders. It is a short book, about 40 pages, easy to read and fascinating because many of the arguments are literally the exact same arguments used today to defend abortion. This is also true within my own denomination. I am a baptized member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and unfortunately there are people and many church leaders, mostly in North America, who use these same arguments to defend killing children by abortion. So, number one, it will distract and divide the church. Leaders in the Presbyterian Church Church said that because slavery was legal, it would not be proper for the church to get involved. There is a great diversity of opinion and intensity of feeling, so let's not address this issue because it will, read it for yourself, tend to distract and divide our churches. We literally hear the exact same thing today about abortion. It's legal, people have strong feelings, so let's not say or do anything because it will cause division. The irony is that Christians today, especially in the USA, will loudly and boldly denounce these slaveholders of the 19th century for being afraid of division while themselves today say the exact same thing about abortion. Unity, unity, we must have unity. So let's not upset church members or leaders by talking about this. Number two, the Zion's Watchman was a newspaper devoted to the anti-slavery cause within the Methodist Church. Leaders said that they disapproved of members reading this paper because it disturbs the peace and harmony of the body by sowing dissensions. We hear the same thing today about abortion. Don't talk about it because it makes people upset. Church leaders said that they should prevent this paper from circulating among members. And if any church members got caught with this paper, they will be guilty of indiscretion and dealt with accordingly. How many churches today don't like people talking about abortion? Within my own denomination in 2011, the Washington Post criticized the hypocrisy of my Adventist church supporting abortion and in the article mentioned a Facebook group, Adventists for Life. Well, immediately the leadership at the general conference complained and cited trademark infringement to force Facebook to shut the group down. Adventist institutions have for many years openly defended and celebrated notorious abortionists and we are humiliated in the international media and pro-abortion leaders are allowed no problem. But if you even dare to have a Facebook group, the GC will shut you down immediately. The exact same spirit that tried to shut down the Zion's Watchmen is the same spirit wanting to silence voices today. Number three, the pro-slavery Christians said having slaves was a matter of, read it for yourself, it was a matter of conscience. It was a matter of conscience that could not be coerced. Now, where have we heard that before? Oh, that's right. The official church position on abortion said that killing children is a matter of conscience and that any attempts to coerce a mother not to kill her children should be rejected as infringements of what? Of personal freedom. As a man, a Christian, and as a citizen, we believe that slavery is a right. Today we hear that abortion is a woman's what? A woman's right. Or as my church says, it is our right and responsibility to decide. Number four, slavery as it exists is no evil, and anyone who opposes opposes this is misguided with fiendish fanaticism. Those who interfere are fanatics. They are infidels. Today it is very common in many Christian churches that if you want to take a faithful stand for the sixth commandment and oppose killing innocent children, you will be denounced as a fanatic. Ever since I started this YouTube channel speaking against this, I have been called a weirdo, wacko, fanatic, extremist, a demon, a moron, an idiot, an agent of Satan, undercover Jesuit, you name it, etc. There are many within the church that if you challenge abortion, they can get really, really nasty nasty and call you some really nasty names. When abolitionists called out the hypocrisy and evil of slavery, they were constantly condemned as 
enemies attacking the church. And today it's the exact same thing. Just look at any of my videos in the comment section, speak against abortion, and you will be denounced as an enemy attacking God's church. And number five, pro-slavery Christians said that slaves were sold and hired out to support missions for the purpose of sending the gospel to the heathen. This is really bad today in my Adventist church because notorious abortionist Edward Allred, who boasted of killing over 250,000 children, people have told me we can't say anything bad about him because he's given so much money to the work of the church. Pro-life Andrew, why would you want that to stop? That's why he was honored at the general conference in session. You can read it for yourself, published in the Adventist Review. This is even way back in the early 1990s when he was full-time engaged in killing all these children he was honored at the GC in session that's why he's listed as an example forever to Adventist students as an inspiration read it for yourself he's listed as an inspiration and ambassador if you haven't seen this video here you will want to check it out the Adventists built a church at his horse racing track and I spoke with a church official who told me over the phone that they are waiting for all red to die so that they can get all of his money in order to do what to do mission of course number six they argued that slavery had been around a long time and that because God had not intervened it therefore must be a divine appointment it is the Lord's doing and marvelous in our eyes without a new revelation from heaven no man was authorized to pronounce slavery wrong same thing Thing today people say the word abortion is not in the Bible and another great irony is that in the 19th century the American Medical Association began their famous physicians crusade against abortion which successfully led to abortion being made illegal in statutory law in every state the great irony is that even though the entire nation was terribly divided on slavery they were in complete agreement on abortion both slave states and free states voted overwhelmingly and unanimously for abortion to be made illegal. Do you see the irony? Pro-slavery Christians condemned abortion and today pro-abortion imposter Christians condemn slavery. Number seven, notice here on page 22 that ironically the leadership was called the General Conference. Someone wrote to a minister who was opposing slavery and they told him that if he were an honest man you should resign. You are supposed to be obedient to the voice of the general conference you must submit to their authority or leave the church and of course same thing happens today if our top church leaders support abortion and you oppose it you are told to submit or leave and that's a very big problem because number eight check this out in 1794 the Presbyterian Church came out with a lame wimpy statement saying that slavery was quote the highest kind of theft but this was merely recorded as doctrine with no enforcement or discipline. So in other words, it's wrong, but if you do it, we won't do anything about it. The slaveholders remained in the church, adding slave to slave. However, as time went on, more and more voices began to denounce this great evil. So in 1835, it was brought before the General Assembly, who decided to refer it to a committee. Remember that. They referred it to a committee, but guess what? The majority of the committee was known to be opposed to the issue. In other words, they referred the issue of slavery to a committee who supported slavery. At their report the following year in 1836, they said, let's not make an issue of this because it will distract and divide the church. The minority, however, filed their report saying that slavery is a heinous sin and that everyone should do all in his power to deliver the church of God from this evil. The slaveholders countered and said, if you call slaveholding immoral or criminal, we will not be subject to the jurisdiction of the church. We will not submit. So now the church has a really big problem. The abolitionists, they won't compromise. And the slaveholders, they're not going to give up slavery. Well, guess what the church leaders did? Because of the shortness of time, oh, there, there's so little time, it is impossible to decide judiciously on the subject. So it will be indefinitely postponed. People, however, continued to send in petitions to oppose slavery. But guess what? A committee said it was inexpedient to do anything further. Again, it was indefinitely postponed. The author says that the reason why is because they did not want to lose the favor of the wealthy slave owners. Church leaders knew that if they decided to take a strong stand on slavery, they would lose a lot of money and members. So it was indefinitely postponed. 
it was more important to be liked by the slaveholders than to put away sin and increase righteousness. And I share this story because this is exactly, this is exactly what has happened within my Adventist church on abortion. It was the Americans who brought this into the church to make money. The Americans covered this up. The church appointed a committee, mostly of who? Of Americans. It was an American committee speaking for a world church where opinion ran much more strongly against abortion than in the US. And it was the Americans who wrote the pro-abortion policies of the church. The Americans and the GC have used their influence to continue to lie about this. And it was the Americans and the GC who falsely claimed the satanic teaching that killing little children is a religious freedom. And it has been the General Conference and the Americans who have postponed this issue indefinitely for over 50 years. They have never allowed the World Church to vote fairly on this issue. The exact same arguments and deceitful tactics of the pro-slavery Christians of the 19th century are the exact same arguments and tactics used by leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church even until today. Absolutely nothing has changed exactly the same. There is nothing new under the sun. Thank you for watching.